Um, so what we what we discussed in the web group was that uh, the the we wanted to know understand what the website was for and what are the issues that we were fa facing. Um, we ad identified the fact that the website currently has no maintainer for the con content. So while it has a developer and maybe even some people doing design, uh, it doesn't have any people writing and, and editing. Um, so we tried to split up the tasks of trying to figure out like what the jobs are that we need to do. Um, we split it into three main pieces. Uh, one is the design. So uh, Ryan was very interested in uh, seeing if we could make a more responsive, more mobile-friendly design, and also creating what other pro projects have in terms of a, uh, what, did you, what did you call it, the, the um, um, glossary, um, the, the, the thing that GIMP has for the website. Oh, um, and Fedora has like that front page for users. Oh, brochure site. Brochure site, yeah. yeah. So like a brochure facing design. Um, we also wanted to make sure that the the content could be considered, like what uh, the, the the layout of our menus, whether the site was delivering the right con content and why, like to which users. So we wanted to make sure that, like our educational and learning con content was being presented correctly making sure that we were um, giving the right information and not making the, our, our menus too confusing because we have a lot of content, but it's probably not all, all organized in the most efficient way. Uh, and Maureen was taking over that job to do a review. And then the final task was was the, was the community se section. This is basically making sure that the, we're connecting up with all of our disparate groups, forums, peoples, companies, everybody that uses Inkscape or, or is interested has a representation and can be found and all, all organized uh, and um, Valestra. Valestra was taking that job of, of doing a community review uh, the tools that we currently have for the community and what tools we might need and how we might want to present different parts of the Inkscape uh, ecosystem um, is there anything I missed we also talked about focusing the Inkscape.org <clears throat> to users and, yeah. and talk about what kind of users and then also but still have a um, a back office site I think of like all the developer tools what contributing contributing yes uh, contributing. So, so something that, that crosses all of these boundaries between uh, separate designs content and, and writing and community is targeting so that our uh, website is able to deliver um, you know, the right things to the right audience. So we know that we have different groups of individuals that use Inkscape, whether it's um, I illustrators, designers, uh, people who make things with CNC machines, um, researchers, and so on and so on. So you know there are user groups, and then there is also a developer core, people who are translators and um, are graphics artists for us, and, uh, web developers and so on, moderators. And so like all, all of these uh, people need to have places where they can go, They're, it needs to be designed well, and it needs to be delivering the, the content that they need. And so we talked about maybe ha having separate parts of the website, whether it should be the same or differently designed so that it, it either distinguishes itself or not, um, and uh, how the content should be uh, broken up in terms of uh, users, and whether that would risk creating a separation between users and developers or contributors Tab or Hans, do you want to talk about the GTK stuff? Maybe. Uh, we didn't talk about that. It's something that we discussed question? for GTK, yeah. for instance, the like, redoing the website before, or just in time for GTK 4, for something fresh. Yeah. I think so 1.0 will be quite a ways out, so I don't know what time frame. Yeah, we should do it now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so, we talked about quite a few things. We have a whole list of problems that I put together. Yeah, I think we spent most of the time talking about two things. One is the GTK, GTK actions are deprecated. These are things that a program can do, that, but they're tied to the graphical user interface. And the replacement is a G action, 
which is, again, something that a program can do, but it's not tied in the same way to the interface. And it's much more flexible. And we've talked about strategies for uh, moving from here to here and what the advantages are. Uh, and the tie in the, into that was also changing the way Inkscape starts up. Uh, probably by doing this, we can make things a lot simpler, a lot, uh, a lot better. The other thing we spend a lot of time talking about is uh, what to do about this problem. We rely on GDL for handling, a library called GDL for handling our dialog docking. And so, for example, here I have layer dialog. And in principle, I can combine it with like the XML dialog. But this doesn't work under Wayland. You can see the blue square over on the, on the left. That's where Wayland thinks it's supposed to be. Yet the cursor is right over the XML editor. So basically, all the docking is broken under Wayland. And it appears that this is going to be probably difficult to fix. The GDL is pretty complicated. We don't have any experts on GDL. And it's not clear that GDL will be supported in the future. Yeah, the problem is that Wayland doesn't have an idea of keeping track of uh, the positions of the, of the windows in a way that we could handle it easily, easily. So we talked about different ways of replacing this. And it was most suggested that uh, we could follow the GIMP method and, and use notebooks. Uh, and you can drag and drop uh, tabs on the notebook windows. So that might be the best way of, of dealing with this. Look, you know, look at the, what uh, GIMP is doing and try is that, to... Is that notebook code? Is that part of GIMP? Is that GTK? That's GTK. So that should work on the Wayland, I'm pretty sure. Okay. So I, I don't know, you know, I don't know how hard it's going to be to do it, but that may be the solution because this is completely broken. You just, once you move the, a dialogue, you know, I can't, you can't put it back. You can't dock it back on the document, you can't dock it in the dialog, uh, dock window, it's just completely broken. So, and we talk about a bunch of other things, but that's, those are the kind of, I think, the two principal things that we covered. Anything to add? Um, <clears throat> I mean, we can talk in a bit more detail, I guess, about what we were planning to do with some of the actions. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. so yeah, I mean, this tab set. <coughs> is it, first of all, is it clear to everybody what we mean by actions? Well, I was, oh, okay. yeah, because I, I, I mean, basically the, the point is that at the moment, the thing that has been deprecated in GTK3 uh, is kind of this weird hybrid where it's an object that contains some information about a, a real action that the program can do. So, you know, that could be something like the verbs that we have. So basically any behavior that we want to be able to trigger somehow. So that could be anything from sort of resizing windows to actually doing something with the SVG document. So any sort of action. Now, the other thing is, though, it contains information about what widgets uh, that display that interact with that action should look like. So it contains information about, say, icons, uh, the text that should appear in menus, and so on. Now, um, that's being removed. Instead, we're left with the combination of two things. So there's the G action, which is really just a thing that describes behavior. So it's pretty much just some object that um, will have a name and you can hook up to a function that does that thing. Um, and then separately from that, you have actionable widgets. So that could be something like a button or a menu item or whatever. And so they've been separated out. Now, in Inkscape, we use these in, I think, a bit of a an unusual way in that we're not actually making use of the action of it at all. 
all we're really doing is making use of the uh, display information. So what we're using them for is just to put things on the toolbar. So all we're doing is we, we have a, just this widget that will either display as a tool icon, uh, sorry, a tool button, or if the toolbar's too short, it will sort of pop off the end and turn into a menu item. So it's deprecated, it's sort of the wrong way of doing it. We can get rid of that. And we can instead move on to, in our toolbars, really just using regular widgets um, that we just pack into the toolbar and then hook up like anything else in the program. So that's, the, that's how we can handle the toolbars. And then anything that really I want in the sort of a thing that can be uh, triggered anywhere within the program, that is really something that should be handled by Inkscape verbs. Those can then be rebased on the new G Action um, API. So what we'll be doing is um, making Inkscape's core functionality, so all of these actions that can be triggered, um, those will be done in a in sort of G kind of way, and we can access those from anywhere. So moving on, this leads us on to how we can restructure the application. So what we can do is register all of these possible actions. So we do a similar thing with our verbs at the moment, but register them as being things that the Inkscape application can do. And that will then sort of, any of the widgets that we have anywhere inside uh, the Inkscape GUI should be able to just trigger those actions whenever we want. So we can hook up all of our tool buttons, um, all of our menus and whatever to that. So the advantage of doing this is it separates out a lot of the behavior from the display. And so at the moment, we've got two different applications. We've got Inkscape and Inkview, Inkview being the one that we use just for displaying um, SVGs, and Inkscape being the one that obviously has the full functionality. Um, what we can do is set up these two different application uh, GUIs so that they both make use of the same sort of underlying application, um, but just display the GUI elements in a different way. And so all we really need to do is just make a window that has all of the widgets tied to particular underlying actions. And so this opens the door to creating new things like a simplified Inkscape for kids, where, again, you don't need to rewrite the entire sort of um, event handling for the, um, for the application. We just create a window with simplified tool set and only hook up the actions that we want the, um, the sort of simplified interface to, to expose. Um, yeah? Does that help because earlier Bryce was talking about how like the API documentation is like spotty and stuff. When you hook up every everything as a G action, does that buy you stuff in terms of opening up the API to other applications and documentation? Yeah, yeah so the way that it works, each um, action just has a, a text string that, um, that provides uh, a name for it. And so that action will be scoped to something. So for example, you could have something like, as a simple one, like, um, app dot, uh, I don't know, I think some simple Inkscape can do. So just, yeah, app dot, so fine. So you could just have an action with that name. And then when you're designing the GUI for your simplified Inkscape or whatever, all you need to do is um, for any of the GUI elements, you just say, um, I think dot add action and then just give it the name and that's it. But, but I, I think what you're kind of getting at was that, yes, this would be an interface that we could uh, advertise to users. So like one idea is a headless Inkscape that there isn't a, a UI at all, and you're just directly triggering the actions through command line options or a script or console. What are you talking about? Yeah, there is a console in there, with, right? With the, right, with the right interface, could these actions be called to, say, for instance, extensions? So instead of yes. extensions having to have their own mm -hmm. machinery, yes. they can just call into verbs and do their job. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, basically all that's happening at the moment, we um, the events that are triggered within Inkscape are largely coming about through GUI interactions, right? So you've kind of got button clicked or something. 
right? What it does is it moves that event handling away from the GUI elements. And so instead you have the action which will trigger something called, uh, trigger a signal called um, activate, right? So the what then happens is that in the GUI, when you click on the button, if you hook that button up to that action, that button will trigger the activate signal on the uh, the action behind the scenes. So you're you're no longer actually directly tying the behavior uh, the the um, function callback to the button. You're just hooking the button up to this underlying well, core that's action. Cool because you can these actionable widgets can be you can have different types of widgets, buttons or radio buttons or toggle buttons, all connected to the same yeah. action. Yeah, action. A menu, a drop, you can, it can be a drop down menu, it can be in a toolbar. You don't have to have separate uh, duplicated code yeah. as you'd have to have with a GTK action. In terms of documentation, uh, maybe it could be useful to have as a development policy that whenever a G action is declared in the code, you have something like a doc string explaining the semantics of, yeah. of it, mm -hmm. so yeah. that it can be extracted as part of documentation. Yeah. yeah, and that way, you know, anybody who wants to make a new sort of uh, front-end application, that would really just be a case of hooking up the, the named actions within a list. Oh, thank you. All right. Did that get recorded? The fonts. Uh -huh. Do you know what variable fonts are? <laughs> yes. Does each letter change cool. every time you use it? No. 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 <laughs> no. Uh, this is something that that's an old idea reinvented. Okay. It's the idea that instead of a font having a particular weight, for example and then having to have a different file to have a, a different weight of the same font. It's all in one file. And you can have a slider and you can choose exactly what weight you want between the two limits. And things get interpolated in between. So it can be weight, it can be how condensed something is. And there's even some example fonts now that, you know, they change the look, like it, they add circles inside, the, you know, or, or dash lines, you know, there are a lot of things you can do. Or even some animation. There's a, an example font where it's got little figures like a, a person bicycling, and by just changing this, <laughs> this slider, you get the, the feet in a different position. Uh, this is something that is going to be supported. It's already supported in all the browsers. I think Firefox is hidden behind a flag still. Uh, Chrome's exposed it. I think Safari has exposed it, and and I don't know. It will, it will be coming to uh, Edge too. Okay, so this is something that's getting wide support. And there are a lot of people behind it, and so this project that we have is is to add support for variable fonts into Inkscape. And I've already got the rendering done. You need to have a very recent, in fact, unreleased version of. Uh, Angle and heart fuzz. It's in one forty two, yeah. Okay, it was something okay. I mean, anyway, you have to have very very recent uh, libraries to, to, to use it. So these these all if deft out until yeah, they yes, have yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Uh, so now the project is we need to be able to extract out the information from the fonts. Uh, to present to the widgets, no. the widgets to know what sliders are available. Uh, fonts can have predefined settings. Already, those are exposed. It just it, it works already. Uh, we don't have to do anything to do that, but we probably want to do a little more work on 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 that. Will you end up putting these in the font dialog or in the toolbar? In the style, in the font style. Uh, right now, right now, uh, it will show you if you're using a font that has these settings, the CSS settings. It will show it to you in the uh, style dialog. But we need to be able to say, have the user come up and say, okay, I want to create a new custom setting 
open up sliders and things. To, right. yeah. And you probably want to have something that will change maybe multiple text elements all at the same time if you decide, okay, I, I, I want all my text to be a little bolder or a little to tweak it. So we, we've got to come up with a, uh, a way of being you know, presenting how we're going to present this to the user and the easiest way to do that, as well as being able to extract out the information from, from uh, the font about what, what axes are available. There are five set axes which correspond to already existing properties like weight. Uh, CSS font level four, which is not close to being finalized, uh, will allow you to actually set the weight. Right now, you have to you have to set the weight to 100, 200, 300, some multiple of 100 up between 100, and 900, or you know bolds bolds like 700 defined 700. Uh, normal regulars will find like 400. In CSS4, you'll be able to choose the weight, you know, any integer number. Yeah, in support that in GTK CSS already. In GTK? Yeah, we implemented in CSS okay. It's, it's uh, supported in Chrome, but it's not supported in Firefox. And I don't even know if they support behind a, No, I don't think they even support that behind a flag yet. So could, Yes, and you can also animate that with like CSS animation. So yes. You can yes. So you can have your bicycle. You can you can actually animate your bicycle rider, you know, moving with uh, CSS animations. I saw an example of these on the on the demo, uh, GTK mm -hmm. demo, where the OK and cancel button have uh, both uh, the weight uh, uh, changing with CSS animation on mouse over. So it gets bolded gradually, and then when you place your mouse out, it goes back to normal gradually. It's fancy, it's maybe silly, but it's a demonstration of technology, right? Um, regarding uh, Inkscape, uh, Tav um, uh, made some commits last week mm -hmm. that finally got rendering working on, on Canvas. Um, I, I, I had attempted doing that eight months ago, but um, the stack of libraries were not ready yet, and not, now we have it, so so Tav did it for us. And um, just before coming from Brazil, uh, I made some commits on, on a branch for a dialogue. So now, now we, we can open the, the SVG example file that already has um, several text elements with different settings of the same family, but with different uh, settings and it will load from the CSS settings and populate a dialogue with the sliders and it has its names. Uh, but this is not yet acting on on the canvas. If I if I drag the, the sliders, it's not not yet hooked up the other way. That should, that should be easy. That should be easy. That that's something that we, we would like to do. Like Bidav and I worked on this for GTK and Tango before Christmas and it took us quite a bit to like get through all the layers of font caching like Mm -hmm. Every everybody wants to cache the font information, and then you have to like update all the caches. And if you change something on the fly, it's tricky. Okay, we we got to work in the end, but yeah. yeah, I think I think that's not going to be a big problem for us. Yeah. Well, because well, what we're doing, we what we need to do now is update the the CSS for each text element that you you're mm -hmm. working on, and then it automatically will it goes the rest. Yeah. will do the, it should automatically do the rest yes. unless there's something I'm, I'm missing. Yeah, but by editing on the XML editor, you can get results mm -hmm. already on Canvas. Yeah, but by yeah. 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 XML and then editor, then yeah. it, it, yeah. will, it will work. Yeah. Plus the user interface. Uh, yeah, that's that's, that. that's my my major concern okay. because we, we were like in the in the moment of um, adopting the technology, but we are we do not necessarily have the best interface for that. Yeah, because we have we'll have we'll have the scalable or the these right ones and. Yeah. and the old style ones, and how are they going to distinguish between the two? How are they going to know? They'll have to be a flag stuff. added probably to uh, the font instance saying that this is a variable font or not. Mm -hmm. And then if it's a variable font, mm -hmm. add a table or uh, a list of the axes. 
that are available and what are the limits. Yeah, and I've started right. working on that. I'm pulling all, out all the open type stuff into a separate file as it gets quite messy because like, like for example, uh, uh, there's stuff for font variations. For, uh, this is a little bit different where you can choose uh, different styles of the glyphs. Uh, but getting that information out of the font is not trivial, kind of messy. And hopefully Tango or HarpFuzz will eventually have functions that can give us that information easier. It's not very close to this in there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's really complicated because open type fonts can have different scripts. The scripts have different, have different languages. So depending upon if you're, if you're doing something in English versus Czech, you, you can have different, different options. Right now in Inkscape, we ignore that. I just go through and I, 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 I take everything out. And there's a, if you compile with a very recent version of libraries, you actually can see the variations in the Inkscape text menu. You know, the different uh, glyph styles. Does the, um, the variable font aspect show up in SVG itself? What do you mean by? It's a, it's a CSS property. Okay. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. So, yeah, and we read this, we can now read and that CSS property. It gets passed along to where it needs to the rendering, point of rendering. And then things like convert to curves, works transfers in. For, for whatever setting of the variable font that you have, when you convert to, to curves, you get yeah, that. Yeah, that can work. It'll work to get it because Tango. You can give Pango a font descriptor, which tells you the weight and all these things, and they've added these axes to it. And then you can ask, give me the open type font, which we need to get the, to get the paths. But it, it doesn't actually fill that the font information that you need to get the variable font, so you have to go back and add that in afterwards. It took me a while to figure that out. So again, it, it's a Pango functionality that's, I, I would consider it a bug, that you don't, the, the open type font handle you get doesn't include already that, that information. So one interface thing that kind of gave me a little bit of it is, I remember once I was trying to use a ligature that was in a font, mm -hmm. and someone told me, well, Inkscape has support for that, but there's no UI Place there, there, is a UI. there is a UI part, but, oh, okay. but it has to be. You have to it has to be linked to a very recent version of uh, HarpFuzz, I think. So probably the library that I have is too old mm -hmm. to be able to use it. Yeah, I can. I can. Uh, and and the problem is that the, from from a user experience point of view, it's it's not not really good yeah. because you, you don't have preview. You have you have uh, tabs. So that there's one tab for open type vari uh, variations. Uh, Unfortunately, these names are pretty similar, but they are, they are completely different things. Uh, so open type features, yeah. Um, so you have a tab for selecting open type features, but when you are in that tab, you are not seeing the preview widget. Uh, so, so you can't and, and take you also don't know. What I, what I did in the function that was to basically just put the preview in both together. Tabs. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So I think we, we would need an overhaul in terms of user experience. Uh, uh, Designing something that works. Uh, Some of the things we discussed yesterday. Not, not just interesting. Yeah. Thing. We talked about like once you can like tweak your font in this elaborate ways. Like we've done a lot of work on, on this one font, and maybe you want to reuse it later. So maybe you want to like give it a name so it appears in your font chooser. Oh as yeah, a, yeah, yeah. As mm -hmm. a name insert. That could be like and creating new fonts on the fly essentially. And maybe you want to like have a way to like define sets of fonts that work well together. Yeah. And I think there's. Some tools you mentioned on the whole export is kind of thing where you mm -hmm. like basically have a very specialized font man management tool that lets you like put together like groups of like fonts that you want to use as a group somewhere. Right. Else. But like you know, I'm working on a project for this company, yeah. and these are the fonts in their brand book. Yeah. So I'll kick that, have yeah. that in my environment. That'd be really nice. Yeah, this problem should uh, it, uh, manifests itself in two different scopes. Uh, across documents, as you mentioned, but also within the document. Um, 
I believe that perhaps we should have some way of managing a selection of a, of a variation, just like we, we manage uh, gradients, because you have potentially infinite settings for gradient, and once you use that, you, you, you get a gradient ID, mm -hmm. and you can apply that to other pieces of uh, content on your yeah. document. So for, for a variable font, that would be desirable, mm -hmm. because once you selected that specific weight you want, or the specific variation you want, you would uh, desire to have the same thing used in several places of your document, yeah. and then tweak everything together. Uh, some types, uh, more, more advanced uh, typesetting programs uh, do have uh, things like a, a, a title palette, title font palette, and paragraph font palette, which are these concepts of this, this style, um, style settings that you can apply globally to a document. So Nate was talking about like, almost like a text style thing that you want to be able to name and reuse. Like, it's not just the font variations or the font itself, it's, it's also like something like open type features, like small caps or something, mm -hmm. or like some running variations or some ligature well, yeah. thing, well, like plus sorts well, of things like, like line height or, or paragraph level settings that might be relevant, which are not technically like font properties, but they right. kind of belong like to this. Is a how you want your text to look. As an entity that you can reuse. Yeah, yeah and the, the, the gradient idea, yeah. how it was done with the gradient, that's a good um, model. And this, this is tightly related to the problem uh, that this, this article uh, describes, uh, I, I was mentioning. The name of the article is, um, let me see, uh, The Anatomy of a Thousand Typefaces. So this article is about um, the tyranny of choice, where you have like thousands of font files or families, mm -hmm. and you have them ordered in alphabetical order yeah. with no meaningful relation, yeah. just just alphabetical order. You know, and you have like yeah, so things for like, greeting yes. greeting cards and things for readable blocks of text, and there's no yeah, relation. I, yeah, I've run into that myself, and I'm not really a a designer or anything, but you, at least on Ubuntu, you would, you want a font, a particular font. Well, it comes in this font bundle, you know, a package of fonts, like 20 fonts or 50 fonts. You install that, that one font, now you open up Inkscape, and you got like a humongous list of fonts, and where's that one that I wanted? Yeah, and it, yeah the, that, the whole management of, of the fonts is, is really good. Cool. always keeps talking about the, the fact well, that, like, there often is more design information about fonts available, like, for commercial fonts, like you can but get like specimens and like nice very documentation very that shows the features of the font, but that stuff usually gets lost when the font gets packaged in like an RPM or yeah. some dev or something. And yeah. Then you're just left with like the glyphs essentially. And a lot of the value of the font is no longer apparent or hard to use because all the documentation is gone. So the proposal here um, uh, is based on uh, data mining of the Google Fonts uh, collection. Uh, where uh, the the features of the, the, the characteristics of font families were um, analyzed numerically by looking at the, the glyph outlines, uh, because all of the metadata that is necessary the theoretically could be found on the open type tables, but not all of them are there and it's not consistently um, declared in all of the families. Of Okay. So uh, this this author uh, the author okay. of this article decided to just do it uh, by directly looking at the glyphs, and then with that data, it's possible to sort families by by several different aspects uh, of similarity, and then there's a, 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 a different proposal of user interface for showing this to the users to navigate by categories and so on. So I think this ideally could be an alternative dialogue uh, on, GDK, on GTK by default. Or maybe not replacing with the basic one, because some people may, want, mm -hmm. may still want the, the basic one, but uh, there, there could be an advanced typography for the user. Right? And, and then we would just use this. So maybe this means shifting development of efforts from, uh, from Inkscape to GTK in that aspect. Uh, and instead of crafting our own font chooser, which is what we have now. And it's not very clear why do we have a custom font chooser instead of using GTK. Yeah. 
Yeah, but what is the, the GTK function is just a very simple one, basic. Yeah. And that's that's a we yeah I remember when we put in this plot manager and, and part of the the issues that we had one was that the, the listing of plots that we had didn't match all the plots we installed and the other problem is we didn't have a preview and so that those were two things that we got with the plot that uh, we have now but um, it all it has always had kind of some rough edges to it and the person that developed it I So, yeah, so I'm very excited about hearing ideas for how we can move things forward. And I, I, it would be great to, to be able to send things upstream, but Inkscape is necessarily going to match what upstream. Mm -hmm. I mean, it may be more complicated than what they would want. Well, I think there's like the current GTK functions are very simple. It's good enough like for like the uh, settings, mm -hmm. like for GNOME um, settings. It's good enough for GEdit maybe, right. maybe. And, but there's a whole class of applications where they would want like the more sophisticated functions, like the GIMP functions that would yeah. easily see Jim in the more so this, dialogue. So this GDK might be an area where, like, rather than try to push it into GDK, you could prototype internally and then afterwards. Well, package it as a its own thing mm. that's separate from Inkscape, but that we maintain, mm. that we provide, that is done in a way that GDK could use as well and, and share with other and if they wanted to take that upstream, then they could take that package. Yeah, but it would if we made it, you know, contained as its own thing, then we could deal with it in a few different ways. Mm -hmm. yeah. Our dialogue is very tied to CSS and the CSS that we use. Yeah. So then we make that a prerequisite for this particular tool. Yeah. But it's well, a CSS file. You know like CSS the, too, right? In general CSS CSS right and, and whatever they codify is the way that things go in the mesh and and inside GTK, we are constantly moving closer to follow whatever comes out of the CSS working groups. Um, mm -hmm. If some features get specified in a certain way in CSS, then it's quite natural for us to want to move in that direction. Mm -hmm. So that's not really an obstacle. I think the, the big lacking thing lacking in this dialogue is preview. You know, so yeah. being, a, being able to take a, a, a section of text and then seeing what options, what it looks like with different options, and yeah. being able to choose. That, that's something that we also need a lot of new more APIs for. Right? Basically, when I was last working on like open type font stuff in GTK, I really wanted to play with like being able to highlight like, oh, I turned on this open type feature now. Like, if you see that, it's a very subtle difference. You want to highlight that <coughs> in the preview, so that you can actually see what what the text. No, we know it's me. I'll know you're working on this. Tom, you had. Just just I, 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 I don't know if you can see at the very bottom of the dialogue there. There is a, a list of. I see. Yeah. Th th those are kind of like obvious cases, right? Where you actually really oh, clearly yeah. see that changing. There's a list of what's in the font. Yeah, I actually extract out the style tables yeah. and show you 